Welcome to Investment Portfolios. This is Finance 480. And uh, I'm your online instructor, Diana Block. The, this is week one, and we're going to talk a little bit about some introductory information regarding investment portfolios and the background information we need before we start getting into a lot of the reading that is happening. So what I want to talk about first is our return objectives. When anyone uh, is making an investment, they have some specific objectives in mind. Sometimes those objectives are realistic, sometimes they aren't, but they have some purpose for making this investment. And pretty much everyone wants to preserve their capital. That's a universal goal, universal objective of investing is to keep what you have safe, for sure. This is what motivates a lot of people to just keep their money in a regular savings account. They're afraid to invest because they don't want anything to happen to it and then they end up with less than they had originally. So keep in mind that even those who are willing to invest and take some risk, they are still absolutely looking to preserve their capital. In order for capital to be preserved in an honest sense, the nominal rate of return on their portfolio is going to have to at least equal the inflation rate. And uh, you're going to do the reading this week, but we understand even on a basic level that if you aren't at least earning the inflation rate, even if your actual account balance stays the same, you're losing money each year because that same $100,000 is going to buy less five years from now than it will buy right now. So if you aren't at least getting a return that equals the inflation rate, you really aren't preserving capital. So that's something to consider when we're thinking about objectives of a investment plan. <clears throat> the second thing that most of us are looking for when we invest is an appreciation of capital. We want our capital to grow. That's the whole reason we're willing to take some of these risks and make investments is because we want it to actually grow. We don't want to lose anything, but we actually want it to grow as well. And so in order to do this, we've got to create returns that are exceeding the inflation rate. If their return is only the same as the inflation rate, they've actually just broken even each period. And so when an investor has the intention of growing his capital and then at some point um, in 18 years having enough to send their child to college or in 30 years having enough to retire. They're looking to have a larger amount at some point in the future than they have now. We'll need to be generating returns on those portfolios that are beyond the expected inflation rate so that their capital can appreciate and grow. You may have some people whose investment objective is current income, whether they are currently retired and withdrawing from their investments a current income to live, or even um, maybe younger people that have uh, inheritances or uh, lump sum amounts available to invest that they are able to get a current income from. And so when an investor is looking to generate income from their investment, that changes the scope of um, how we will manage that for them. Because um, they're looking for regular monthly or quarterly income to actually meet their living expenses and spending needs. So uh, periods of no returns or negative returns is going to have a serious detrimental impact on their current income at that moment. So we have to consider the types of investments that will most likely provide them with the income that they're expecting when they need current income. And so the total return is what we're going to refer to as just the need to grow our capital from appreciation and then we're going to reinvest that appreciation back into the investment portfolio and just continue to have that all grow into a total return. Um, so we're looking for capital appreciation and then reinvestment of that appreciation. So this is in the sense they're not looking for income. We're just going to continue to reinvest and watch all of that grow, hopefully exponentially.
So these are the basic return objectives that most investors will have. And this is institutional or individual investors. They want to preserve capital. They want their capital to grow. And some may want income in certain situations. And then a total return is just reinvesting all the capital appreciation. So you can see exponential growth. Those are our return objectives. So let's talk a little bit about risk. Um, each individual investor, again, whether an uh, institutional investor or an individual investor, has specific uh, levels and feelings about risk um, that they are willing to, how much risk they're willing to accept and how much risk is uncomfortable for them. And so when we're looking to specify a measure of risk, um, this is one of the most important issues because first everyone needs to understand that there is risk and be able to get a handle on how much risk they're willing to take. Uh, and so we can measure risk two ways. We can look at absolute terms, which is a specific amount of variance or a standard deviation of the total return. So an, an easy example is they don't want to lose more than 3% of their investment, period. That's a 3% loss and they're out. That's an absolute term. Um, or it could be a relative amount of risk where they're comparing to a specific um, tracking fund like the S&P 500 or some other market uh, tracking and when they're a certain amount away from that uh, benchmark um, then they will consider that too much risk so it could be relative to some specific market index or it could be just an absolute amount of their portfolio and so we want to talk to uh, those investing about what their risk tolerance is, uh, a, whether in absolute or relative terms. And then we also have to, of course, look at their overall willingness. And this is more than just numbers. This is about their psychological or behavioral factors. What are their spending needs currently? If if a client needs these funds, like we talked about in the previous slide for income, at the current time, then their willingness to accept risk will be different than someone who doesn't need these funds until 30 years from now. So we have to consider what are their long-term obligations, what kind of targets they've set for themselves, and uh, what are their personal financial strengths um, that will help them to be able to tolerate risks as they come along. And uh, that goes right in hand with the investor's ability. Some investors are not able to handle risk. Again, we have to look at where they are in their life cycle, how much dependency they have on that income, or how quickly they will in the future need that income um, from their investment. So if there's a short-term horizon, when they will need those funds, that's going to generate a lot of discomfort around risk. Um, but if the investor is financially stable currently, there is a long horizon before they need access to those funds, he has more ability to be able to handle risk and give the portfolio time to recover. So those are some things we want to look at. The actual measure of risk, whether it's absolute or relative to some index, and what is the investor's willingness and ability to absorb risk. Lastly, as an introduction uh, to our course, I want to look at some life stages. I think this will be some interesting information. And when we get into working on our course project, which the information about that is in Unit 1, this information may be helpful to give some perspective as well. And so we have life stages, and of course in our early investing years, when we begin our first full-time job, maybe at 18 or 22 after college, at a young age, this is the best time we know to start investing, those early investing years. Unfortunately, this is a time when a lot of people aren't thinking about investing, but um, their early investing years will affect how well they can tolerate risk and how... Uh, 
they are able to reach their objectives later. If they start investing early, uh, these early year investors will approach things a little bit differently. Early investors, however, usually on their first full-time job, aren't making a lot of money. So when you then you've got your good earnings years. When you've got 10 or 20 years until you retire, you've kind of found your niche and you're fully involved in your career and hopefully you're making a lot more money at 32 or 42 than you were at 22. So these people may have a lot of additional income that they are willing to invest because they have excess income at the end of each month after they handle their expenses. Um, they may have a more opportunity to invest than they had in their earlier years. And also they're creeping closer to uh, retirement and have maybe loftier goals re regarding that as well. Um, then you may get into a even higher income and saving years. When you have 10 years until you retire, people start seriously thinking about what they have saved. And generally, this is when people kick into high gear and start saving more because they get to, to the point where they have 10 years left for retirement and they realize they don't have enough. And they're like, oh my goodness, I need to get into high gear saving. And also, hopefully, they have a higher income at that time. So these are years when they really start to save and invest. Then we can look at when uh, the distribution stages occur. Um, often, retirement can last as long as your working career. Um, it is not uncommon um, for people to live 25 to 30 years in retirement and and they only work 30 years as well so we have to look at how we can distribute that wealth uh, that's been accumulated during your working years so that it lasts throughout your retirement so that's basically in two stages you've got your early retirement years when you've got more than 15 years that you'll have to retire uh, rely on whatever you've got saved uh, and whatever you've invested and your returns you got 15 years to make that last and so these are people who are taking very little risks because they're no longer earning income uh, from employment from their career they've got their nest egg and it's got to last them the rest of their life and they've got at least 15 more years to go whereas in the late retirement years um, they have less than 15 years left so they are very concerned with just preserving and so that it'll last for the remaining time that they have of life so these are just some of the different life stages that you want to consider when you are uh, going through the cases in this class, the homework assignments, and also when working on your final projects, you may want to address the return objectives, the risk objectives, and life stages um, as we have discussed them here, which ones and which uh, requirements specifically apply to the cases or assignments that we're working on. I am available by email, phone, uh, Blackboard IM. There's office hours posted, but you can reach me outside of those hours. Just send me an email, and if you want to set up a phone appointment or if you just want to talk by email, that's always appropriate, and I'm always available. I check my email multiple times all throughout the day and night, so you'll always get a quick response. I also look forward to talking with you and learning more about you in the class discussion this week and each week. So you can ask questions there as well. There's a forum for questions. And I look forward to talking with you and have a great week one.